There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on the earth, distress among nations, confused by the roaring of the sea and of the waves. It sounds, you know, at first glance, like some far away, mythical, fairy tale place, right? Think, okay, really, like, we look up towards the, the, uh, the uh, sun and the stars and the moon, and we don't really do that anymore. That's, that's astrology, that's old fashioned. Oh, and the sea, you know, we've tamed the sea to the roaring of the waves. But have we? You know, there's this uh, old, old wisdom. There's a lot of wisdom that we Christians have received from the Greek philosophers that preceded us. The Stoics had this very profound intuition. We come to resemble that which we adore. And what we adore is what we give our attention to. We come to resemble that which we adore, and what we adore is what we give our attention to. This, by the way, is the intuition that led Christians in the early second millennium to, uh, to begin the Christian adoration. Because they thought, well, there's something really profound about a God who would, as it were, leap down from eternity into this world and dwell among us as a man. And not only that, not only did the Word become flesh, but that man chooses to dwell among us as bread. As the Panis Angelicus, you've probably heard that old Latin name, Panis Angelicus. Um, in the Old Testament, the Panis Angelicus, the, the bread of angels was the manna, which has kind of appeared with the rising of the dewfall as the, um, as the uh, Israelites were coming out of Egypt. It was the bread from heaven, the, pe the bread of angels that God used to feed the Israelites. But we, ever since Christ, have a new bread from heaven, a new bread of angels. And that bread is Jesus himself. Here we are, the very beginning of Advent. The very beginning of Advent. Looking towards what? Towards a little city. You know, Royal David City, as they say. Bethlehem. Bethlehem, which means what? The house of bread. The house of bread. Because we are hungry. We have, we have too much to eat, and yet we are hungry because what we eat does not nourish us. We have so much to see, and yet our eyes, our senses are starved, even as they are saturated. Because we no longer hold before ourselves the bread of angels to contemplate in its poverty, in its dépouillement, in its, uh, you know, its self emptying What is our monstrance today? By the way, monstrance comes from a meaning, a lot of word meaning to, to, to hold up. What is the monstrance we hold up in front of us? You know, for, for decades, perhaps the monstrance of the, that held the Lord's body for us to contemplate how our God is so humble, he even turns himself into the bread of angels to feed us. That monstrance was replaced decades ago by a screen, a TV screen. You know, because those, those uh, images that danced across that screen, they were so much more interesting than this God that really turned himself into what seems like the most boring thing ever. Bread isn't even a very interesting food. And for that matter, I want to point out that Jesus doesn't turn himself into just any bread. He turns himself into the Passover bread. You know, Passover bread is not very good, right? Passover bread, it's you just take the wheat and you mash it into flour and you mix it with some water and you cook it like that, right? You don't add salt, you don't add yeast. It's not risen, 
some people like it, right? Can we have bread that looks more like bread at the first bread? If you want to do that, that's fine, okay? Our Eastern brothers and sisters, you can still have the bread. But if you want it to be like the bread that Jesus turned himself into at the Last Supper, it's not going to be very exciting bread, right? In place of that, we have something more exciting. We have our latest TV shows. We have our latest prayer prayers. And now we don't even have to wait to go home and watch it on TV because we have little screens in our pockets, right? We have our mini portable monsters as we pull them out when we're in the subway or when we're in the grocery store or when we're bored. We just pull out my little portable monsters and I look at my little portable gods. You know, they might be movie stars, they might be singers, they might be the neighbor down the street that's spreading the latest gossip. And you know what? You feel more alive when you do that because you're like, I know this before anybody else does. I know what that politician in that country next door did this time, about 30 seconds before the guy beside me does. That gives me power. Right? <laughs> I feel so, so alive. Except for that shot of power lasts a good what, they say seven seconds about, right? So that's, you know, our, our attention spans are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And so now people aren't even able to sit through a whole movie. You know, they, 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 they watch videos that are shorter and shorter and shorter. And that is what we feed ourselves with. That's what we feed ourselves with. That's what we feed our eyes, our ears, our smell, our taste. That's what we're feeding ourselves with. And you know what? We are hungrier than ever. We are hungrier than ever because the food we feed ourselves with is junk food. The spiritual nourishment that we seek from our little gods, sure, they give us a hint, so they give, but we have to get those, that hit over and over and over and over and over again, more and more and more and more. And, more. and so we're tied more and more and more to our little monstrances, our little screens. And then maybe we come here to this Mass, I, you know, by some miracle, because maybe that we even show up here anymore is a miracle. <laughs> and what's in the center of the Mass? This very dark piece of bread that Jesus says is his body, that becomes his body. But it remains bread. It comes the bread of angels. The bread that is his body with which he feeds us. Jesus is coming. And that's what we hear in today's second reading, which is from the letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. We hear this invitation for, from St. Paul to, uh, to be ready for the, the coming, that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. At his coming. You know, it's those very words in St. Paul's letter to the Thessalonians from which we get the name of this liturgical season, Advent. Jesus is the one who is coming. The Advenians. But in his coming, he's already here. In fact, it's the exact opposite of the false food that we get from the false gods that dance upon our streets. Because it, with our false gods, we have this sense of presence. Oh, great. I watch, I don't know, one of these YouTubers. Kurt Hugo Snyder, Snyder or something. He has 9 million followers or something, whatever. I watch him. You feel this really close connection to him. You're like, and God, God bless him, I'm sure he's a great person. Or even like me. I mean, I have, I have one of my videos that has, what, 35,000, 40,000 views? I don't know. I don't know all those people. I mean, hopefully God and his Holy Spirit can work through them. But, you know what? We look at those people and we, 
you got nine, people, 9 million people who feel close to that person. Close enough that they have subscribed to that person. Maybe you're one of them. Maybe I'm one of them. But it's not a real presence. They are taken as much as they would like to be. We would all like to be gods. It's not a real presence. That presence is over before it began. But you know, the presence of Jesus in Advent begins before it's here. Because what are we waiting for? We're waiting for somebody who is not yet, but already. And then when, once Christmas comes around, it'll be already, but not yet, because Jesus is always coming. Jesus is always coming. The best image, perhaps, that can accompany us throughout this Advent <coughs> is the image of pregnant expectation. Why? Because pregnant expectation is very real. We are expecting one who has come, but the one who is to come is already within us. As a child is in the womb of a pregnant woman. Can a woman who is holding her child in her womb hold that child in her arms? Can she smile at it? Can she talk to it? Well, she can probably talk to it. She can probably smile, but it's not present in the same way. There's something else about pregnant expectation. Somebody who genuinely loves what they are pregnantly expecting will begin to change their life as best they can. When we become pregnant with expectation, it's not always expected. In fact, I'll bet you, you probably most of us in here probably didn't even realize it was that until you came in and you saw purple and you're like, oh, it, it's different. It's Advent. Guess what? We should all be pregnant <laughs> with expectation. And if you love what you're going, what you're pregnant with expectation with, you're going to eat differently. Now the baby will help you. Sometimes you can't help you crave different things. But you're going to eat differently. You're going to behave differently. You're going to realize that that baby inside you has a relationship with you that has already begun. And then you know when the baby's going to be born, whether you change your life now or not, but the way you receive that baby, the way you welcome that baby into the world, even if that baby is your savior. And by the way, this is not only true for Jesus, but for how many parents has their children been their savior in some ways because, you know, they might be living dissipated lives in one way or another, and then all of a sudden they hold a child for the first time and they realize, the whole universe is being given to me through this child. I need to step up and become the mother or the father that God is calling me to be, or at the very least, that this child invites me to be. You realize that at this time, Jesus is already in our midst, but he's not in our midst as a baby that is born yet. He is on our midst as a baby that is coming. There is a way to prepare that I would like to propose. This is part of a two-Sunday parish mission, so uh, I'm going to give you homework. I don't know if any of you... I used to teach in university, I'm sorry, so it's an old habit of mine. But uh, now that I've just matched YouTube and social media and all that, I'm going to ask you to watch a YouTube video. But if you get home, if you feel like it. Um, there are little, little sheets that have been passed out that actually have a link to uh, resources that you can use. They're in the back if you don't have one. Uh, it has a web address, it also has a QR code if you want to do it on your phone, because I do belong to that generation. Anyway, and um, 
on those links, on one of those links, there is a, there is a link to a, a, a YouTube video made by some of our Jewish friends. And I think that it's very good for us to re-enter into the Jewish world during this time of Advent because you know who it is? Who the people are who need to wait for the Messiah? It's the Jews. So in a way, we, we really reconnect with our Jewish heritage during this time and really all the time because as Pope Paul the VI said, spiritually we are Jews. We're, we're spiritual Semites. They are the, the branch onto which we are grafted as Catholics. But there's a, there's a really great video done by a Jewish acapella group called the Maccabees for a, um, for a group, for actually a group of bloggers called Jew in the City. And it's the Maccabees cover of The Sound of Silence, which is a song that came out about 50 years ago. You know, if there are any kids here, you can ask your parents or grandparents about it. It was really popular. It's still a really great song. Anyway, um, but. The thing about this cover of The Sound of Silence is, in this video, they're inviting Jew, fellow Jews to observe the Sabbath. To observe the Sabbath by unplugging from their phones and being with each other. So that they can receive the, God, the, the gift that God would want to give them by simply being attentive to God's presence and to the waiting that comes with the Sabbath. So I'd invite you all to maybe go look up that video and really appreciate how much the Jewish tradition against this and understand right now that what God is inviting us to in the season of Advent is a Sabbath, a pregnant expectation for something that is to come. Something that is to come, and in that expectation for us Christians, it's already here. And I'd like you to, maybe throughout the week, if you feel so inclined, if you want to look at this parish mission as an invitation to retreat, to enter into, into an Advent Sabbath a little bit more deeply, maybe even to take some of that time that you would have spent on the internet or watching TV or on your phone, and maybe be quiet for a few minutes, read some scripture, or maybe just notice the world around you, and then journal. Journal about those pregnant expectations you have in your heart. And ask God to guide your journaling and help you to know how He is already present in this waiting for Christmas. So that this Advent can be a true preparation for Christmas. Because this Advent, this expectation, is an expectation of something that is to come. And so here, as we launch ourselves into this week, this first week of Advent, I'd like to leave you with the words of a man who is much wiser than I, uh, Angelus Silesius, who wrote the Cherubic Wanderer. And this is an invitation for us to prepare our hearts so that we can let Christ be born in us. He said, Though Jesus Christ in Bethlehem were a thousand times of his mother born, if he be not born in thee, then all the same art thou lost for eternity. Could but my heart become a manger, God would then become a child upon the earth yet once again. Let's take this time, these four weeks of Advent, to maybe fashion our hearts into mangers that can receive the Son of God so that when He is born, even if He finds no place in the end, He might at least find a place in our hearts.